it's about the current testing of electric equipment in the workplace. Don't care what it is, but um, we're going to do that. So, so a brief history of um, uh, in-service testing. So, you know, pack testing, as it's commonly known, relatively, uh, relatively new. Back in the 1980s, uh, me medical equipment is pretty uh, standard practice to do um, what was known as acceptance testing. So a new piece of kit came into the hospital, before it went into service it was tested. Even though it was brand new, out of the box, uh, we did acceptance testing, we did in-service testing. <clears throat> what did we use to do it? Uh, this beast here, um, I, I was trying to give it some scale. Uh, any, anyone who's ever used the Seaman Supernova, uh, it, was, it was about eight kilos and um, stood about that high, about that wide. Well, that, that's heavier than a super. It was about 10 kilos. It's in um, an instrument case, so it was about, you know, with, with that, it was about that wide <coughs> and about that deep. <coughs> you had to put it on a table or whatever it was. Um, and one of the challenges with testing in a, in a hospital was. Well, I was split, all the electrical staff had to you know, share that amongst us. So it looked like a brief, I had to test 80 pieces of kit a year. Not, not a day, 80 pieces a year. Um, but breeze, this, this <clears throat> uh, uh, cardiac monitor, and it tells me it's a bit printed out, you know, proper old printers with holes up the side, <laughs> get this list out. <clears throat> It's in the coronary care unit, so I pick this 10 kilo thing up, walk up, you know, a good, a good trek, 10 minutes walk up to the front of the general hospital, go in the coronary care unit. I reckon, I oh, know we've loaned it to ICU, okay. <clears throat> walk, intensive care, no, we haven't got it. We've, uh, <coughs> some of the RBI in, in, in Newcastle, they, they borrowed it. So, so most of the time was just trying to track stuff down, but lugging this thing around. Um, analog scale on it, you chose whether it's class one or class two, you chose, there's different types of medical equipment which are called B, BF, CF, you chose class one, class two type, LEDs came on around here which, which told you which of the 16 tests were applicable, so you turn to the first LED, push the test button, turn to the next one, toggle switch here, so that was normal mains, reverse mains, <coughs> Um, and you basically went through it and, and loaded the numbers down. But it, but it worked. Um, <coughs> it was um, originally known as the Liverpool Tester, because Liverpool University Hospital, the, the, the technicians there built the first one. Um, it was then manufactured by uh, a company called Grace, it was called the Rigel 233. And then in 96, uh, Seawood acquired the Rigel for us. So, well, the Seawood now. Um, but, but non medical equipment, it just wasn't tested, so it was only really medical stuff. In uh, 1989, electricity workmix came along, uh, Tim and I were talking before we started about, about different events that, that sort of prompted the current testing, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I kind of, um, my forefathers sort of gave me the, the story down with me, so, so I, I don't know the, the absolute facts, but most of the stories I'm told involve someone getting a shock in the workplace and that prompted um, someone to do something about it. The then owner of Seawood told me that, um, so I think it was in the, someone in the railway industry, a guy in a, I don't know, it was a tin hut or whatever, got a shock off a cattle uh, and there's a risk of prosecution. So they came to Seawood and said, can you make us a, a, a box that will test, safety test appliances? Um, so that was a sort of birth of pack testing. There's you know, electricity work rigs, put, a, put a, a duty of care on employees to, to provide safe equipment in the workplace. And um, but how do you do it? You know, what do you what do you test? What do you test it with? And how do you do the testing? You know, there's no formal guidance. There's nothing in electricity work rigs that say you should do a 200 milliamp earth bond test. But you know, it's just. So, so then best practice starts to happen, so it's so guides. One of the first ones I saw was, I can't remember what it's called, it was from the, I, the IT industry, and it was about 100 milliamp earth test and an insulation test. Um, 
Then in 1994, the IEE, as it was then, for MIT, they published a code of practice for the service inspection and testing. European countries, uh, Germany, Austria, and Netherlands, so this, this is VDE 701. So, so European countries were kind of ahead of us. They, they published standards that, that told you exactly how to, to safety test something in the workplace. Uh, and in Australia and New Zealand, uh, they published 3760 back in the early noughties. So, you know, we, we have a kind of practice, other places have standards. Um, <clears throat> so, I, you know, I mentioned TC85 thought we're going to write a, 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 an IC standard uh, which will tell you that we're covering current testing, testing after repair. So, we started, it was about 2007, exactly uh, when it was. <clears throat> Uh, I thought, I was at Seaward, I thought, happy days, there's going to be an international standard covering back testing, so all, all of these countries that we couldn't access, you know, we, we, we would sell predominantly in the UK, we sold loads of product into Germany, market leaders in Holland, loads of product to Australia, New Zealand, Austria, you know, different, but once there's an international standard, we'll be able to sell it everywhere because everyone's going to be doing this. Um, so, uh, <coughs> We had loads, an unbelievable amount of objections. You know, it went to the IC, went out to the all national committees, and we just bombarded with complaints. Uh, the, the, the IC committee for uh, standards covering IT equipment, which is lots of the workplace, you can't, you know, you can't be right standards on testing our equipment. That's that's ours. That's our job. We, you know, if there's going to be a standard written for recurrent testing, it should come from us. It's not in your scope. Stop it. Um, people who made uh, standards for white goods, same thing. You know, you, you're outside your scope. You know, I said, but your product standards cover design tests and cover production, but there's no guidance for recurrent testing. Yeah, yeah, we know that. Well, are you going to add it to your, no, I've got time. So, so it doesn't exist, but you don't want anyone else to do it yet. Basically, that's it. Uh, we haven't got time to do it, but we don't want anyone else to do it. So, so um, it, obviously, it, it, we spent other five. I, I spent, I'm spending a month at Seaward, almost an entire Christmas break redrafting it um, to try. Uh, to try, it was, it was originally based on a, a German standard. So it was the Germans who kicked it off. I, I said, as the, the only native English speaker on the committee, I said I'll just tweak the word in here. So, uh, so it was kind of a hybrid of the code of practice and the German standard. Um, fought against, but we, we, we sent it out, out voting, we, we got a positive vote, we got more than 66.7 positive, less than 20, we thought we're finally there, happy days, uh, when are you going to publish it? And <clears throat> for some reason the US National Committee wrote to the IEC with a formal objection, uh, with no idea why, because they don't do recurrent tests in the States, but they wrote to the IEC and the IEC upheld their objection and refused to publish it. So that was uh, yeah, seven, eight, maybe nine years' work down the tubes, you know, having gone through all these arguments. So we thought we tried our best, <clears throat> um, but we could have this. <coughs> so basically, uh, we wrote to the IEC and said we want to cancel the project. Uh, uh, but didn't tell them. <clears throat> uh, we, we're going to start uh, again at the European level. So it's so IEC is international. We're going to go to Senelec and we're going to try and write an EN standard because then that will become a uh, standard throughout Europe uh, and, and BSI will publish it as a British standard. So um, to try and smooth the way, what we did was we, the original 62638 covered recurrent and testing after repair. We said we maybe have an easier job here, we split it into two standards. We'll write one for testing after repair and we'll write one for um, recurrent testing. So um, <clears throat> out of it came uh, EN 50678 which was published in 2020 and that is general procedure for verifying. So that's testing after repair and uh, six 5699 is recurrent testing. So, so 678 is after repair, 65, 6, 5699 is recurrent. Um, 
So after repair one, good idea splitting them up because BSI published it, not a whim, but happy. Um, <clears throat> then we published the recurrent testing one and BSI insisted on a, having a national forward in there because the same ones who were crying before, oh, uh, let's you can't say how about how to test IST equipment, that's our job and you can't talk about, and uh, the HSE uh, weren't happy and uh, the guys, the principal electrical engineer rang me saying, you can't write a standard telling people to back test. I said, I'm, I'm not. This doesn't say you have to do it. This just says, if you're going to do it, this is how to do it. So it's, it's a bit like the code of practice in that respect. It, it's a set of guidelines on how to test, but the, the, the decision on whether you're going to test doesn't come on the standard. That comes from that way as well. Um, so I, I'll, I'll skim through the dots and bolts. But, but um, so the so recurrent testing standard went, that somehow went off to the um, uh, the uh, BSI Technical Policy Committee, so it didn't go through the normal channel of TC85 and up in penalty, but it went off to the, the Technical Policy Committee because it was a bit of a, a political hot potato. Um, th this is a tongue down, the original national forward they proposed was basically saying the code of practice is, is right and the standard is going to damage everything. So, so it was kind of tempered down a bit, but so, so they put in this warning in, in, in the national forward saying that um, the testing in this standard could result in erroneous safety test results and possibly damage the equipment, which is, in my personal opinion is absolute garbage. You know, these are tests we've been doing for, uh, you know, in my case, 30 plus years, uh, earth at 200 milliamps, insulation testing at 500 to 250 volts. It isn't going to damage it, um, but uh, you know, that's the two <clears throat> So, in terms of a current test standard, th this is what's available to the UK at the moment. Uh, Fifty six nine nine is published in. Uh, it's dated twenty twenty. It actually came out in twenty one. Um, for anyone interested in or involved in, there is a separate standard for medical equipment. Um, EN six two three five three. I'm not going to talk about that today, but. Uh, if anyone wanted to, I could come talk to you about that in great detail for about three and a half weeks. So with, who decides what's medical equipment? Is there a, like a crossover? Yeah, I, 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 there is, um, and I can't tell you what it is, but I, I stumbled across that yesterday on a forum thing. Uh, there is a formal definition. Um, it, it'll be in, in the medical devices directive that there's a a definition of, um, and it's something along the lines of whether it's used for treatment, therapeutic, there's a list of purposes, so, so it's intended for use on the patient. Um, if, it, if it isn't, uh, then the, the other uh, definition, some, or some things included in the definition, is whether it's used in a, a clinical environment. But uh, there's lots of I think, I think of examples, um, you know, like an ultrasound scanning room, there might, there might be a monitor connected to the scanner in there, but that, that's not medical equipment, that's a, a monitor so that a um, person on the couch can see the, you know, see the scan taking place, but that, that wouldn't be classed as uh, medical equipment, but there may, you may take additional safety steps to make sure that that monitor had exceptionally low leakage currents or, or what have you. But, um, <clears throat> there, there is a formal definition of was there also a distance between that treatment bed and where the patient could sort of lay down that's like a meet within that meter distance? Um, it could be construed as. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure. I've heard that somewhere. I yeah. Sure I've read it or heard it, but um, so th there is some. Um, there's. Th there's meter <coughs> down that patient being treated should also be treated as a medical pat test as opposed to a normal pat test. I mean, that, that makes sense because the tests you do on medical equipment, uh, there's additional tests. And, um, you know, talking about things being hazardous, like the, the conditions you look for is the patient's on a metal bed, so if they touch something live, um, then they're going to act as an earth pattern. Uh, and the other is if 
if the, if the beds that the patients isolate from Earth and they're alive from the equipment they touch on this Earth, so there's, there's, there's two scenarios there. But so, so that what they can reach would certainly come into it. Uh, it, it um, in my time in medical physics was yeah, getting up for 30 years ago. But uh, in, in our, I work in the oxide department, so in our scanning room, if we had uh, non-medical equipment, we used to run it from an isolation transformer. So, so we treat everything within that patient environment as if, as if it was a, a medical device and would increase safety. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, there, there is a standard, it's been out for years, but it, it, testing medical equipment is a, is a lot different from, from non-medical in terms of, you have to do an awful lot more tests to do because uh, you know, in most cases, you talk about whether something's accessible, the fact you're connecting it to a person, it's academic or it's accessible or not, because you, you make an electrical connection onto their body, so you, you appreciate there are um, additional safety requirements to make sure that they don't get shocked with equipment, and equally, they don't uh, uh, they don't act as an earth path. <clears throat> so, to, sorry, to yeah. test electrical equipment, then, do you have to have a specific level of additional qualification or skills to do that, or is it? What's the... you, 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 I don't know if there's any legal requirement. Um, the, the, the Code of Practice talks about competency. The, the new British standard talks about uh, electrically skilled person. Um, my own experience was that I started medical physics and they handed me this crate. Uh, and I, you know, I did electrical, I had a degree in electrical electronic engineering. So uh, I, I knew my way, but I had no background in safety, so I had to kind of work out. So I, I don't know whether there's a, a qualification, is there a general equivalent? I'm not that? aware of one for testing. <laughs> You're talking about medical equipment? Yeah, yeah. just, just yeah. Yeah. So, no, you need to be competent to do it. Um, but I mean, obviously, what you don't want to be doing is doing a, a PAT testing course and then going <laughs> yeah, and testing yeah. medical equipment because it's much more involved <clears throat> and you need a medical tester as well. Yeah. So my, my own personal experience was, you know, it, in the hospital I worked in, it was only biomedical staff that did the testing. We, we didn't let anyone else come in and test it. Um, <clears throat> and the hospital estates department were, were people who um, were capable of doing PAP testing, but they, they wouldn't test any medical equipment. That was not why else. Uh, there's, um, you know, that, that old tester, there were 16 switch positions. So in addition to earth insulation, if you measure that protective conductor current, you need to do it with normal mains, you need to do it with the mains reversed, and you need to open a neutral, normal, reverse, disconnect the earth, normal, reverse. Uh, then you have to do um, t leakage current from the enclosure of the medical equipment, you have to do leakage from each of the patient connections, you have to do what's called mains on applied parts, you have to apply mains to the patient connected parts and make sure there's no earth path. So there's a, it, it, it's, um, it's dead complicated, but but it's more involved than. Uh, yeah. But um, I, I guess <clears throat> with that added complexity comes you know, extra opportunities, and uh, I suspect it pays better than uh, the pap test stuff. <clears throat> um, the introduction in in sixty fifty six nine nine. Um, so it's intended to provide a uniform test procedure for recurrent tests of current using equipment. Um, and appliances during their operating life in workplaces. Um, th th this is possibly interesting, but in, in the European one, it said it can be considered by employers to support compliance with the um, EU Directive 2009-104 EC. Um, so the UK version of that is the Pure Rex Provision and Use of Work Equipment. So you remember at the start I was talking about presumption of conformity. What this is saying is if an employer follows this standard, it can demonstrate compliance with, the, with that European directive. Uh, and in the same way, um, if you follow the British standard, um, not a legal person, but um, I suspect if, if the judge said, well, Mr. Brown, what have you done to comply with pure regulations? Well, Your Honour, uh, I followed the guidance in um, BSEM. 5699, and I tested it within the standard to go away. You know, then, what else could you have done? You, you followed a, a British standard.
Um, <clears throat> the tests described are simple, fast, uh, well approved, uh, and safe for the testing person, which is an important aspect of them, and it can be done on site or in the laboratory. So, so that's from the introduction of the standard. In terms of the scope, if you're going to read the standard, always read the scope, because that tells you what the standard applies to, and equally importantly, it tells you what it doesn't apply to. Um, and days of seaweed were people running around flapping their arms in the air going, the customer's just asked if our products meet, uh, you know, IEC 123, and I don't think we'd meet. I said, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. <clears throat> what standard? And they'd say, oh, you know, the standard for um, petrol powered lawnmowers. Why would, you know, they've got the wrong standard. So, so read the scope. That tells you what it applies to. So it's applicable um, to basically stuff covered by low voltage directive. So above 25 volts AC, 60 volt DC, up to 1,000 volt AC, 1,500 volt DC, uh, and some fairly big kit, you know, up to 63 amps. Um, it can be equipment connected uh, to final circuits by a plug or covers permanently connected equipment. Um, and it, and it, it assumes that the equipment in, that you're testing um, complies with its related product standard um, has been introduced uh, has been introduced onto the market is in, and is in use. So it's assuming the equipment, you know, we, we said before about buying something out of Argos or whatever and go, Ooh, I don't think that label on the back meets British standard for, it, it's, it's assuming the product conformed, to, you know, it was type tested, it met its product standard when it was placed on the market and when it was put in use. So, so the purpose of this test is to make sure it still complies, not, it's not an acceptance test. Um, but it doesn't cover testing after repair because there's a different standard for that. Things that are part of the fixed installation, so you know, consumer units, RCDs, etc., uh, uninterruptible power supplies, electric vehicle charger stations, generators. Uh, doesn't cover things that um, ATEX, uh, ATEX zones so from mining. And it doesn't cover medical equipment. Doesn't cover arc welding equipment because there is a separate standard for um, arc weld for testing of arc welders. It doesn't cover machinery, so it's, it's basically workplace uh, accepts those. <coughs> right down to the nitty gritty. Um, so he, here are the limits. So, so I've broken this down. What I've shown you here is that here's the limits from the fifth edition of the code of practice, and here are the limits. Uh, 5678 and 5699 after repair, current. The, the very, as you might imagine, they're very, very similar because the test you do after repair uh, and the test you do in, you know, in service are very similar. So they both have the same limits. It's got a much simpler um, earth continuity limit. You don't have to buy a test tool, it's got a, a calculator built into it. You put the lead link in, and that's was a bugbear in mind for years. That, that's unnecessarily complicated. What, what you're checking, really think about it, is whether there's a, a good quality, fairly low resistance earth, so that under a fault condition, you get a decent sized current up the earth wire in a fuse pumps. You know, where, it, it, uh, whether it's 0.75 or 0.82, it's like, oh, whoa, the fuse is going to blow. You know, so it's a bit, bit of common sense. Um, so, so for cables up to five meters long and up to one one and a half meters squared, it's just 0.3 ohms. What one limit? If you've got long leads, you add 0.1 of an ohm for every additional seven and a half meters, but there's a ceiling of one ohm. Uh, in Australia, New Zealand, they've got one limit, and that's one ohm. For Earth continuity testing, they check everything against the one ohm limit. Um, so all this, you know. Pushing the probe a bit harder, scraping a bit of whatever off to, to get. Oh, no, 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 I can't. Oh, point, point zero one over. It's kind of, you know, yeah. So, some countries like Australia said if it's, if it's less than an ohm, hunky dory. Europe is typically around half an ohm. And, and in the UK, uh, we disappeared up around the backsides and came up with this point one plus a half hours of resistance to the lead. So it's, it's a single limit. <coughs> um, the IET for insulation just have one limit in the fifth edition, um, whereas the standards put a lower limit in place for things with heating elements. You know, anyone who's tested anything with a heating element knows that the, the insulation will degrade over time. 
um, I think back my, my I used to have this, it was a company called Gallon Camp, like laboratory equipment, and we had this, it's called a heater stirrer. It, it, it looked, it was a thing that went round and round with a heater in it, and we used to use it in ultrasound lab for, for stirring stuff, stirring stuff up, heating up. And every year I tested it, it failed. Uh, and I put a new element in it, and, uh, and then someone said to me, have you tried switching it on first for a few minutes? And then, and I did, tested it, fine. Elements become porous, the, the hydroscopic, you get moisture in there. So it's, you know, people with cookers, you know, I'm like, every time I put the grill on, it trips the RCD, but it only it doesn't do it after that, it's because it warms up and it, and it dries out. Um, <clears throat> so so this maybe uh, a few people out there can change in elements for, uh, for for no good reason, because the IET have uh, put the limit the, the minimum up to one ohm. Class two is the same. Um, protective conductor current. Uh, it's, this, this is the traditional limit for product standards. IT have upped it. Um, <clears throat> the one that uh, it's in red for good reason. The, the, in the fifth edition, uh, the IET got rid of the 0.25 milliamp class two touch current limit, and they made it within five milliamps. I don't know whether they thought. You know, we, we're not that smart, but we call two limits. Um, it would just have one. But th there are quite serious implications, which I'm about to explain to you. So um, the standard is 0.5. That's what the order of magnitude different. The, 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 the code of practice is 10 times the limit in the, in the British standard. Um, <clears throat> I have written to the IET through, through Gambica. As, Chair of the company, thing. just to say, um, you know, it, it's grossly different from the, the what is now published brick standard. Um, it, it, it was it a mistake, or um, you know, in, in a polite way to try and you know, find a, a way of tackling it, and um, they responded saying that the limit they have was taken from a product standard. It, it, it is, but. I believe it's, it's the wrong limit, um, and I'll, I'll explain why. <clears throat> so yeah, it's gone from in the fourth, in the first, second, third, fourth, it was 0.25 milliamps. Fifth edition, it shot up to five milliamps. Um, so this is uh, there is um, within the standards world, there are quite a few standards which are which are referred to as basic safety standards. So, so they don't talk about a particular product or a particular application or a particular test method. They are written by technical committees for other technical committees. So, so you get gurus on the physiological effects of current through the body and they write whole standards on that just so that other committees, when we go, what should we choose for leakage limits? There's a basic safety standard that tells us you know, the sort of limits we should use. So there's a number of those basic safety standards. And one of the IEC rules is that we have to use them. We can't start creating our own limits for things. We should follow basic safety standards. Uh, and uh, IEC 60479 it is the safety, basic safety standard for uh, physiological effects on the body. So I, I used this many years just in, in you know, like safety talks and stuff. But you know, I was saying about the volts that jolts, the mills that kills, uh, half a milliamp is generally not perceptible. So you do you touch something, 230 volt, and it was only half a minute, you just wouldn't know it was live, you just wouldn't feel a, a thing. When it gets up to about one milliamp, you'll start to you know, give me a bit of a nip that it wasn't it wasn't dangerous, but I felt, I felt a tingle. The maximum let go current, so that means that's the, the current will take the hand off it. So so up to five milliamps you should be able to let go. Um, between 10 and 20 milliamps, you can let go, but it's, but it's starting to get painful now. It's quite a nasty shock. 30 milliamps, it, it's severe pain, muscle contraction is maybe difficult breathing. Um, familiar number to, to sure lots of people around the room. When you look at an RCD, that, that's why it's 30 milliamps. Because all, all of these things, um, yeah, you, you, no one wants to get shock, but um, you know, they're recoverable, but it's more. Do we do that again? Um, once you start getting 100 milliamps, uh, VF refers to ventricular fibrillation. It's a 
um, you know, casually clear, charging. Uh, it's when the heart doesn't pump properly, it, it, it goes into it fibrillates. So, um, so possible VF after three seconds and death, pof, death possible. Um, when you go up to one and a half amps, uh, it's likely you're going to get skeletal damage and death likely. So that's why the limit in most product standards is chosen as half a milliamp. Because if, you, if I can't measure more than half a milliamp, if someone touches it, it's told me before about hazardous life, accessible parts, if there's less than half a milliamp on it, no one's going to be, uh, there's no hazard. And not only that, you're not aware of it. The code of practice limit is five milliamps. You're certainly going to feel that. And that's the maximum let go. Um, it, it, in the um, letter that Gambik has sent to the IET, and this was after uh, I drafted it up, but it was in consultation with Fluke, Mega, Seawood, so all of the manufacturers to make sure it was a consensus and it wasn't just a sort of Jim Wallace rant to the IET. It was, you know, we, we all agreed. Uh, as several people pointed out, yeah, it's, it's not going to kill you, but if I'm using um, circular saw and I, you know, get five milliamps off it, it's not just the electrical hazard, you know, there, there are mechanical hazards involved. Someone using power tools or whatever, you know, there's a touch current of five milliamps or, you know, let's call it four, it's going to pass four milliamps. You do test, pass it, customer comes to use it, grabs it, gets a shock off it. You know, yeah, it says it was safe. Oh, well, it meets the code of practice. Um, so, uh, the reality, I uh, spoke to someone recently, you know, well, what do you think is going to happen? Um, <clears throat> it, it's not, you know, it, it, at that level, the code of practice is unlikely to cause someone serious harm. So, so I shouldn't imagine anyone's going to go out and collect all the copies up. Uh, uh, and republish it. Uh, I think we'll address it uh, over time, um, but it's out there. But the, the, the important thing in my mind is is we now have an alternative. We've got a, a published British standard, so the code of practice, I personally would be um, testing the accordance with British standard, or, or any, I'd be testing the accordance of the standard rather than a code of pro practice if that, if that was the choice. Um, so would, would, the, would you advocate that for the previous slide, then, where there's the differences on the... Absolutely. Oh, it doesn't matter what the... If, if you said to me, uh, go out and do this job, and here is a, a pretty standard that tells you how to do it, and here's a code of practice, whatever it was, say, give me the standard. Because standards are, uh, you know, recognised methods of doing it. A code of practice, as I said, is, is the opinion of a, of a group of people within a, an industry sector. A code of practice, uh, so a standard, is written by experts in the field and, and has been reviewed by the, the standards community and has been published by a, a recognised body. So it's gone through all of that peer review process before it gets to publication. That's not to say there's, you know, sometimes there's mistakes and errors, but uh, a standard uh, always has more clouds. I, I, I would personally, I would follow the standard. That there's the the only objection I can imagine people having to it is, or oh, I have to shell out to X number of quid. Or the alternative is, uh, you know, Tim or someone else provides training on the standard and, and provides you with the information uh, that's in there. You know. Uh, because it's, it's, it's in a public domain, it's in a standard. Um, the standards aren't copyrighted, so Tim could uh, cut and paste the standard into a set of training course, but he could replicate the information. Um, and it just again, as an aside, um, I think it's more a case, Jim, that we're going to publish from pattern <coughs> different yes. sort of standards, that, <coughs> different test limits. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm in just, terms of you know, this one says in code of practice, but actually, if you get this value, that's still okay. Yeah. Um, you, might be, you might be thinking, where do, where do these numbers come from? Uh, you know, how, how do you know that you can't feel that tingly, oh, can't let go? You know, how, where do they get these numbers? Is it done? Yeah. Cal calculated <laughs> by, well, 
How many people are subject to themselves to that? One of the things that, about being involved in the IC is I get to travel, and um, I've been to the Austrian Standards Institute in Vienna a number of times, and uh, I saw, not, it was, this was a picture rather than the actual thing, but so, so these are actually, I saw, I saw the shoes, they're, they're made out of copper, copper slippers. Um, there, there was a, a bowl of, of saline, um, there's, a, there's an ECG, uh, bear in mind, you know, there's some fairly old equipment here, this was done in the 1950s, uh, I think for measuring uh, I squared T, which is related to fusing time, uh, RCD breaker, uh, these are hand electrodes, a defibrillator, happen to have one of those on site, um, and this guy is an Austrian physicist uh, who was called uh, Gottfried Begelmeier. So, so this man um, connected himself up, <laughs> um, had, a, had, had a colleague uh, was on standby with new fit because there was, a, you know, as, as, it, as he turned the wick up, there was obviously a problem possibility he would kill himself. <laughs> but so he had, had someone on standby, but uh, this guy basically pioneered the RCD. He, he, he measured the, the physiological effects on the body. So these aren't, um, is it, it isn't guesses. And not only do it once, when, when I saw, when I was in Austria, um, all the different diagrams. So, so he's, here he's measuring, because the, the effect of the electricity on the body depends on, on the sort of entry and exit points. So one of the worst cases is hand to hand. So you can do hand to hand, uh, left hand to right foot, left hand to left foot, so it depends on the battle of the body. So you imagine the worst case is you grab it, it goes straight across your chest and through your heart. Yeah. So, so when you, I started off fixing TVs uh, many years ago and the golden rule was put that one in your pocket <laughs> before you put, so you never put two hands in because if you touch two parts you get it across your chest. So you see, so I didn't want to have the time, so he's measuring it you know, hand to hand here and then they, they were, yeah. Yeah, he puts copper slippers on, puts his foot in the bowl of sailor to get it proper, uh, puts electrodes on, and so, so um, and actually he, he rang me up and he said, have you seen the code of practice? Five milliamps. <laughs> 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 it's 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 mad. <coughs> no, he said he died in the, in the noughties, but um, he, he was still g gaining patents in, in his 80s, so uh, yeah, he, he pioneered the Physiological effects and, and uh, invented uh, RCD, so top banana. What about the death one? How did you figure that one out? Uh, well, I looked, yeah, I, did, uh, I was looking at the picture the other day. Uh, I, I, was the I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he, he, he was well in, he was in his late 80s, I think. It was too. Yeah. I, I, I think it was old age. Yeah. Or possibly uh, <laughs> shot by lightning. <laughs> So, that, that's the standard, that's, um, that's what's in there. Yeah, just ask a very quick question, sorry. Oh, no, far away. What yeah. was the BSEN for art welders? We went, yeah. pretty, I just wanted to make a note on that one, sorry. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I'll give you a couple of presentations if you want, anyone wants to. Oh, yes, so, yes. I'll, I'll give it to Pattern and they can, uh, there's nothing, there's any contentious in there. Um, 609-74-4. Yeah. Right. At the moment, because that um, Seawood's Dutch distributor asked me in I'm going back, about eight years ago, could we make a welding adapter for, for testing up? Because it's a standard now, can you make an adapter for back testers to do uh, welders? Because you have to measure, I think you measure leakage from the uh, electrode and uh, isolation of electrodes from ground. There were a couple of quite quite interesting tests. Yeah. And um, like any business, you know, the first question was, well, how many will you sell? He said, could be looking at 10 a year. Yeah? Said, wow. So, so, so I'll go to the board and see if we'll say, I want to invest £100,000 to develop an adapter uh, and we could sell 10 of them for about 100 quid. Yeah. And so, Top idea. <laughs> but we're glad you're still here. Yeah. Um, so it didn't happen, but uh, the GMC, I know they've got it, I've seen it, I've used it in exhibition. It was quite, um, quite a complicated looking box. There was, there was a box that connected the, and did the leakage things, and there was another box that measured the, I think the terminal voltage on the. 
I think you might, <clears throat> it's probably, uh, you know. So would that, that would include the current testing of uh, the art world? Uh, I don't. Because <coughs> one, of the, one of our customers has hundreds of welders, and I made it very clear that it is a very simple process that we'll be doing on it. Yeah. And I, I couldn't remember what that EN was. They reminded me back in, put it on the documents, not tested to yeah. BNC yeah. EN. Should have called my back because this particular customer has already been in trouble several times with the AGFC. But at least they can see that it's not tested to BNC EN 60974. To go my back as well, and if they want that, that's the end. Oh, sorry, 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 EN. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> did you get a drink? I'm very sick from this. So, yeah, if it's if I've done a practice on it and told them that it's done to yeah. the extent that they want to be tested, I'm going to be very honest with you. It's been tested to 50699 and it hasn't been. Include, doesn't include the, the additional tests or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I to yeah. be clear on, especially if, yeah. if the HSC gets involved with that. I think again. the H well, I went to with the Higher Association, um, six C with a, a long standing relationship, they got in touch. They had some, there was some ongoing debate between uh, a, a manufacturer of um, saws. And still is a manufacturer of souls, but I can't tell you who it is. Um, and what the higher organization, because the higher shop was saying we, we have to test this before it goes out, and we're going to do a flash test on it. And, and the tool manufacturer said, You don't need to do a flash test, you can use a prime test 100. I said, well, How are you going to test? You know, it's, it's all electronic, the, the switching, and the, um, so, so I got involved and it ended up writing, rewriting the code of practice and, and doing what have you. But uh, so, so I started going to the technical uh, steering committee meetings and they invited the HSC because it was all about testing and, and they brought this guy from the HSC along and they said, what do you recommend for current testing or, or testing a pair of higher equipment? But, well, I, I'd, uh, I'd probably check the earth if there was one and insulation. I said, well, what about, what about others? What about, uh, Doing a high, you know, dielectric strength test because the, the, the difference with the higher industry is you know they walk someone walks out the shop with it and, and all you know like myself you know did loads of DIY over a lockdown and I'm thinking how do you use an uh, angle grinder to chase a wall this guy goes and then chucks it on the patio and so stuff gets wrecked so so the only way they can see if it's been damaged during the high is actually do you know some more arduous testing so the HSC like oh I don't know. And so they're, they're pushing him and pushing him, and in the end, it's just like what he says. You know, it's kind of, so, so they'll, if you write something that sounds like you know authoritative, and the fact that you're aware of that standard, I suspect they'll just yeah, no problem. At least, at least you've been clear what you have done or what you haven't done. Yeah. yeah. Similar with the medical equipment, if we hired to go into a surgery, then. We strip that we said we do there to do pat test. We're not touching anything yeah. of medical it's equipment right. or within that meter distance of the bed. Um, so, so, do anyone do dental practices? And what do you? I do a lot of dentists. Yeah, because they do them all well, because they've got a mouth of mixers. Um, yeah, they know what else they use. Because where do you draw so, so it's laboratory equipment. A lot of isn't it? Like, yeah. like mixer stuff. Right. I'm thinking of the, of the chair because. Um, the chairs are normally hot, well, that I've experienced, they're normally hot by yeah. this. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. beds, hospital beds, are, are, are classed as medical equipment, you know, because the you know, patient can they do uh, a lot of care homes. Yeah. And, and there's loads mechanical of mechanical beds and mattress pumps and stuff. There's companies that make, I haven't gone back a good few years ago, but there was a company in Germany basically making a, a, a bed tester, sort of tested to, uh, it, was, it was either a, a paired down version of 62353 or a German standard. It was basically a pack tester for beds. It was relatively same expense. It was about 400 euros or something. But there's people you know, just going around testing beds. But you know, some, some stuff you could say, well, amalgam mixes or that, that's laboratory equipment rather than medical because there's no interaction with the patient. But dental chair, you know, there is because the patient's sitting on it. And beds. 
quite a, sometimes a bit of a grey area in terms yeah. of. I did say, guys, we take a